Hello, and welcome to Inside BSKL, the podcast. This series aims to provide insight to parents from our very own world-class international educators. Tune in as we share experiences, strategies, and the unique dynamics of teaching in a global setting. This week, we'll hear a conversation between Leah and Emily on the benefits of play-based learning in early years and their teaching experiences in the classroom and at home. Let's take a look inside BSKL. Hi, I am Leah Lewis and I am Head of Early Years and Assistant Head of Primary here at BSKL. I have been teaching internationally for 14 years now um, and I am a qualified primary school teacher but I have chosen to specialise more in early years since I started my international teaching career. I am uh, a mother of a seven-year-old boy who also goes to the same school here and I am joined today by Emily and I'll let her introduce herself. Hi, Uh, yes I am Emily Clark and I am the head of reception here at BSKL. Uh, I have been an early years teacher forever, always. Hmm. Um, I started out actually doing home visiting work with children from birth to three in their families and then transitioned into classroom teaching and then transitioned into international teaching when I finished my master's in early years. So yeah, it's been a journey for both Hmm. of us, I think. Indeed, yeah. yeah. And uh, I'm very happy to be working with you here at BSKL. Um, I thought we could start today by talking about our classroom environments Mm. because typically in early years we spend a very long time setting up our classroom at the beginning of the year. Yes. Um, There's never enough time and it's never finished and it's never a a done job. Uh, So I thought maybe you could start by telling us um, where you go first and what do you look for when setting up your classroom? Mm, I like to think of it as like a bit of a blank canvas because until we get the children in, we really don't know what the year is going to look like. Like I think that part of early years teaching is very different from teaching bigger children because in early years, it very much depends on who is coming to school that day. And so we want to spend time getting to know them as much as we can before the school year starts. And then once the school year starts, you know, that's really our first six weeks um, is taking that time to find out who are these little people and what do they need and what do they want. Um, But there are always some things that we have to have, like we share a love of wooden blocks, a must have in any classroom. Um, And, you know, there's sort of this this basic level of resourcing. And I know it's, it's really important to me that everything that's in the classroom is there for the children to use and to touch and to get out on themselves because we want to be building that independence. And, you know, I know you find that as well in in pre-nursery. That's even Mm -hmm. more of a challenge. Yes, it is, Um, especially because they're coming to school for the very first time. Mm -hmm. And some of these children, like they're coming from different experiences. Uh, And at home, they may not have seen some of these things before, wooden blocks being a a prime example. And they're such an open-ended resource Mm -hmm. that um, they can be used in a variety of ways, different places. They can represent different things. And And because of that, the children sometimes actually don't know what to do with them other than making a little tower. Mm -hmm. And that has its own purpose and value as well, like the... um the science behind making it balance, the mathematical skills that are involved with building a tower of wooden blocks. Um, but we want the children to use their imagination and start to uh, communicate with their with their friends, um, with their teachers, mm. and really exploring how they can use these things in different ways. Yeah, I think we've all had that experience as a parent. I just realized I didn't introduce my own two kids, <laughs> also a mom, <laughs> of a now freshly 11-year-old mm. and 9-year-old. But I remember those days of like sitting at home and building the block tower and then building it again <laughs> and then building it again. And they knock it down. <laughs> yeah, and you know, it can it can get repetitive at times. And so it's, it's as much about us learning to play and learning to play again as adults as it is for the children. And I think we see, you know, when we're thinking about our classroom environments, it's never done because it's always shifting constantly in how the children are growing, how they're using the materials, um, what new things we want them to engage with. And so I think that's, that's 
a spot where we would love to say it's finished job and we can check it off our to-do list, but that's that's not something that happens in early years very often. Yeah, <laughs> And that's where it's really important that we have good communication with our parents mm-hmm. and the families that we have in our school. Um, and having them come in to the classroom at the very beginning and playing with their children and us kind of showing them how to play with their children yeah. sometimes because it, if it's their first child perhaps they've, they're not familiar with that uh, and with COVID happening over the last two, three years uh, some of them haven't been able to play in, in small groups and, and with other families and so kind of giving them the families that support and I know you worked with uh, some of our parents last year do you oh. want to talk about your parent workshop that you did? Yeah, yeah, we had a great time last year and we were really finding that as we you know build relationships with families, then they're able to come to us and to say, like, I'm struggling with this. And obviously, we're parents, too. So we know, (laughs) we know all about those struggles. Um, And so what we realized was we sort of had this gap where we offer so many things to our parents, um, but a lot of them are sort of a one off training. And we realized we wanted an opportunity to sort of go deeper with our families and sort of work in a small group setting where we could build our skills together. Um, And so that was what we developed last year. And we ran that three separate cohorts and graduated lots of parents who I'm sure are listening Mm -hmm. and um, it was a really powerful sort of shared learning experience and I think we do that a lot in in the classroom and we need to get better at doing that you know in the day-to-day with our with our parents with our families about the whole journey of having young children because we know it doesn't stop at the classroom door it doesn't stop when they get home Um, it's a really holistic, all-inclusive sort of time in a child's education. And that has its own um, joys <laughs> and <laughs> struggles. Stresses. Yes. <laughs> yeah. When you wish that you could just drop your child off at school and all the problems would be solved. Um, but it doesn't always happen that way. No. Was there anything that came up? You said there was three cohorts. Was mm. there anything that came up time and time again uh, from the parents that they wanted to talk about or the struggles that they were having? You know what came up time and time again was eating. Mm. That sort of independence of helping your child to sort of eat and finding that balance as a parent between, like, I need them to eat a healthy meal, but also, like, I need to get on with my day. And also, they'll be fine if they don't have a perfectly healthy meal every time. Um, so, yeah, it's just those those basic things. But also, I think it, it comes back to those relationships. You know, we talked a lot about um, spending quality, positive time with your children Mm -hmm. and looking at sort of what's that percentage of interactions you have with your child in a day that are positive um, versus that are neutral or negative. And so I, I shared that you know, one of ours is is the lift or the elevator, if you're American. Uh, <laughs> we forgot to actually say that we're we British did. and American. We did. And, uh, there's lots of those. Yeah. yeah, and lots of those um, translations. Yep. Yeah, translations. Like we'll just say that. That's a nice positive way to put it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But um, ev- every morning, I don't know why, as a family, we can't get from the house to the car without a negative experience <laughs> in the lift. Um, and so, you know, one of the strategies we talked about was like, take take that was one small moment and see if you can shift it. And I think a lot of a lot of parenting and working with our children is that, is looking for those little shifts, you know. And, and I think there's those little shifts in the classroom too. You know, we're not going to see children change overnight. We're not going to see their reading develop overnight. It's these little tiny shifts that build on each other over and over again. And I think as teachers, we also need to remember that parents, when they see the teacher walking towards them at the end of the day, they're like, oh no, what's she going to say today? (laughs) Um, And we are trying to make a real positive shift to sharing those positive things that happen in the classroom throughout their day rather than going straight for mm, this happened today. Um, And I think it's changing our mindset as teachers. Uh, and I know that our that that was a, a big shift for some of our staff, mm-hmm. and they were very much used to just kind of saying what had gone wrong. Right, or like no news is good news. Like yeah. if you don't hear anything, everything's fine. So you wouldn't want to hear from your child's teacher. But actually, yeah. that's that's not what we want. No, yeah, and that's not what it feels like. I think when you walk through our early years, you feel like the warmth and everyone having a chat. And I think we've really built that over the past few years with our teams. Yeah, and. Um, our team isn't just made up of 
teachers. It's the assistant teachers and the support staff that we have mm-hmm. as well. And so really encouraging them and empowering our staff to have those uh, conversations with the parents at the end of the day. I think they've really felt a sense of um, pride and a sense of ownership over sharing those lovely moments with yeah. our parents. And we know, you know, one of the things we really really encourage is that everyone in that classroom is your child's teacher. You know, there's no hierarchy. Like, we are all here for the children. And that's, I think that's huge. And that's something we've really empowered um, our staff to be able to feel like I am. I am this child's teacher as well. And so I think when parents see them stepping up to that, it just feels good. Yeah. Yeah. So um, the other day, you may have recalled walking past me sitting on the floor in the hallway with a little friend who was having a difficult time. Um, what do you say to sort of our families who see that sometimes children are having a difficult time? Um, you know, what does that sort of look like? What do we want that to look like in our setting? I think it's really important that parents um kind of maintain the confidentiality of that situation. Mm. Uh, And I know it's very easy for parents to go out of the door and say, did you see that that child's um, having a difficult time again? Mm. They're throwing a tantrum again, particularly with the the two and three year olds who it's a a daily occurrence for some of them as they're learning to manage those feelings. The 35 year olds as well. uh, (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. Was it you on the floor or was it the child? (laughs) Were they calming you? Um, But we need to make sure that we are building up those skills for the children to be able to deal with those situations independently. Yeah. Um, but then, like you said, the, the adults also need to have those skills to support the child. Yes. And so workshops such as the one that you did before are really helpful and communicating with the parents as to this is how we supported this situation today. Mm-hmm. These are things that you can do at home. And also finding out, is this happening at home too? Or is it just something that's happening at school as they're becoming overwhelmed Um, and making it a a learning experience for everybody and not just something that we dismiss and say, oh, it's a one-off, it's not going to happen again. Mm -hmm. It probably will happen again. Absolutely. And again. (laughs) (laughs) But I think you're right. You know, you said about skill building and that's what what it really is. Like that's such a huge part of our curriculum and in the EYFS framework, it's actually one of the three key areas. Mm-hmm. It's huge. And so we we don't want children to just stop crying. <laughs> you know, obviously we would love for them to not have tantrums. And yeah. I know at home that's what we all want as well. Um, but we don't want them to just stop crying. We want them to build the skills that they need to solve their problems more effectively, to be able to communicate better, to be able to regulate their emotions. And so we know that that that's not a quick thing, is it? Like that takes some time and some a lot of practice. And finding the trigger. Mm. Is it the same trigger every time? Can we as adults help to remove that trigger or at least give them a warning as Mm -hmm. to this is going to happen in five minutes. uh, So you need to prepare for that. And giving them another reminder. Okay, in one minute, remember that we are going to start tidying up Mm -hmm. as tidying up is normally something that triggers the (laughs) the children. Um, Yeah, and giving them those, the ability to actually Um, work towards solving it for themselves and the independence. And I think one of the things that we do really well is when it is tidy up time and we have given the warnings, then we do tidy up. You know what I mean? We don't, we're very clear with our language and we're very clear with our expectations. So if we've said that something's going to happen, that's what's going to happen. And we'll we'll help you through it. We're there with you, um, but it is going to get done. And so I think that really builds that trust and that authenticity with the children that helps them understand, okay, <laughs> when it's tidy up time, it is going to happen. I'm not going to get out of it. i you better sort this out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't know about you, because obviously you're a mom as well, but for me, um, the thing that triggers my son into having meltdowns is the iPad. Mm. Uh, if I I have to set boundaries as to how long he spends yeah. on the iPad, I have to be very careful as to when. If it's just before bedtime, then he's already tired. Mm-hmm. He's already not able to manage his emotions very well. Uh, so before bedtime is a no-no for me with the iPad. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know about you if, if you have the same issues. Yours are slightly older now. Yeah, well, we've got we've got video games, don't we? So it's like, 
you know, it's a very high intensity situation, especially if, you know, they're playing with other friends online. Um, that really takes a toll mm -hmm. on your, you know, your attention, your emotional regulation, all of those things. And so it's a really heightened experience. And I think, you know, for young children with the iPad, watching YouTube, things like that, it can be a really high sensory experience. And so you do need some time to sort of calm down from that. Mm -hmm. And I think you're right. We do see when you take the iPad away, the tantrums, <laughs> the tantrums kick up. It's like a double-edged sword. Yeah. Um, you know, and we know in the classroom that iPads can be a really powerful tool. Technology can be a really powerful tool, but we don't want it to replace that human, human interaction. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We want it to support that. We want it yeah. to bring, bring something into the classroom that we don't already have, um, but we don't want it to sort of erase all the good things we have. And I think as parents, too, that's sort of similar. It can provide opportunities for our children that they otherwise wouldn't have access to. Yeah. Um, Particularly with like language learning. If, uh, for us, lots of our students don't have English as their first language. Mm -hmm. At home, some of the parents can't speak any English. Yeah. And so giving them an opportunity to engage in, in storybooks on the iPad, um, songs uh, that are in English so they can practice those skills or hear that native English a little bit more, mm -hmm. um, it, it's a really good way of using it. Yeah, absolutely. And sometimes people just use it at the dinner table when you're really desperate. <laughs> <laughs> do you know, I tried so hard to, to not do that, but sometimes I'm like, okay, just just watch one episode. <laughs> but I think, so you know, not quite dinner. It's, it's in teaching and parenting both, I think we find this, like you need to care for your own emotional regulation as well. If you're not calm and you're not able to take a deep breath and recognize that like the child is struggling, then, you know, you need to do, put your own oxygen mask Absolutely. on. Absolutely. <laughs> sometimes the iPad at dinner might be that oxygen mask. Absolutely. You know, and I, I think that's so important. It really can be hard for us as teachers to realize like, what is what is pushing my button? And we have very different buff buttons, I think, too. <laughs> and everyone does. And so recognizing, like, is it them or is it me? Because sometimes it, it will be us and being okay with that. Yeah. That made me think about how um, when children are taking risks mm. and you as a parent think, oh, no, you're up really high now. And you need to maintain your composure yeah. so that you can encourage them to take that risk, mm -hmm. even though so in your heart and in your head, you're thinking, I really don't want them to take this risk. Yeah. But but they are okay and they are confident because they have done this many times before, maybe not with you. Right. And how do you how do you go about encouraging risk in in your setting, in your school? Yeah, I mean it's super important that the child can do it themselves. Like if they are in control of their own body, they've gotten themselves up to wherever they are, um, then they are miles ahead of being able to navigate that risk than if you, you know, help them up to the top, um, which is so tempting, right? Like we know they want yeah. to get up there, but my mom's rule was always like, if you can't do it yourself, then you're not big enough. And it actually turns out to be quite true. Mm. She'll be happy to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, you know, as far as navigating risk is so important. It's so important for children's bodies um, as far as like their perioperative systems. But it's also really important for what what is an acceptable risk. Mm. You know, how do I decide what keeps me safe? How am I in control of like what can I jump off and yeah yeah and not then break that leads <laughs> that leads later to like is it a good idea to go and do this with my friends mm -hmm. or you know we need practice mm -hmm. in those mostly safe settings mm -hmm. to make those risks so when we eliminate all the risk all the choices they don't get that experience and that's really really key um, for their learning and development. And I'm sure that you're the same. Uh, some parents see some of our photos and videos that we send home to them and they say, wow, I, I had no idea that they could do that yeah. um, or that they felt confident to do that. And then luckily they normally go out and go to the playground or they go to a, a, a gymnastic center mm -hmm. and further that skill development yeah. and nourish that uh, interest that they have, which is and really you know, exciting. it's also like academic risk taking mm. for a lot of our kids it translates like for a lot of young children starting to write is really quite scary mm. um especially if they have older siblings you know they see their their big brother their big sister doing their homework and they've seen that writing is 
a specific thing. Very permanent, isn't yes. it? I've and done it, it and know, it's not going away. It has to be away. done correctly <laughs> yeah. in this way. And so we often have the experience of children saying, that's not writing. You know, where we're like, oh, look what you've written. This is amazing. They're like, that's not writing. I'm like, yes, yes, it is. <laughs> but then when they when they sort of transfer into being able to make that mark on a page, being able to have a go at forming a new letter, they need those same risk-taking skills, don't you think? I, I agree, absolutely. And um, sometimes they actually don't realize that they are doing something new because you've empowered them so much and they've felt so confident that they just go with it and you're like hang on a minute let's stop and celebrate this that you've just done yeah. this thing that you've just done uh and um take take the win yeah. <laughs> it's just exciting mm. and you know reading connects as well to writing mm. writing connects as well to reading yeah, and um, especially in reception where they're just starting their reading journey so and it's exciting. so hard. And as a parent, it's so hard listening to them every single night say it's their sounds. It's painful. <laughs> it's really painful. I don't miss those days But the all. reward when they're apps, uh, apps able to do it yeah uh, both as a parent and as the child is um is huge and it's so exciting and it's also a very slow process yeah it really is so we always tell people like by the end of the year by the end of reception like we will be there don't worry don't panic now like, not by christmas no not, <laughs> not by, by christmas not by term two <laughs> by the end of the year yeah. um you know and that that aligns with the curriculum as well and those expectations. And I think we find typically when when children are really given that space and that comfort to develop at their own pace, that they just exceed our expectations in a lot of ways by the time we get to the end of the year. Yeah, I'm reminding parents that every child is unique and your child may read slower than another child and mm. that's okay. That's just where they're at. Yeah, yeah. And I think that parent competition piece is so tricky, isn't it? Yeah. I think we do. We do see that a lot in international settings when you have so many different cultures um, all in one place, which is my favorite thing about working in an international yeah. school. But it does sort of you can have a bit more maybe of that panic than you would if you were in your home country or just with um, with students of a certain nationality because it would be at least the same for everyone. Whereas here, it's a very mixed bag, isn't it, of what people expect. And that can make it even trickier as a parent to sort of calm your own expectations. Expectations. <laughs> <laughs> to be like, no, we're fine. Everyone yeah. develops at their own pace. Yeah, <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, and I think that's a really nice way for us to finish today and remembering that to celebrate those differences and um, remembering that every child develops at their own rate and it's okay. Absolutely. And don't run away from your child's teacher when they want to say hi to you. <laughs> it's probably for a good thing. Come and say hi for us. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Thank you, Emily. It was lovely chatting. Lovely chatting. Bye-bye.